Hello and welcome to a City Voices interview with Michelle Hammer. Michelle is a lecturer, she's an entrepreneur, and she's like a proud schizophrenic. I mean, is that... <laughs> do you, how do you feel? Like, I called you a proud schizophrenic. Like, how do you feel about that? I mean, you, you can call me that. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm schizophrenic and I'm me and I just don't let it stop me from being who I am, you know? I guess you can call me proud. Should I be ashamed? I don't think anyone should be ashamed. You know? Right. Because your your website is called Schizophrenic NYC, and your mm -hmm. you, and a lot and a lot and a lot of your shirts that you design have the word schizo. Well, okay, mentally ill, but some of them have Schizophrenic NYC on it, right? Well, well this does have Schizophrenic NYC on it. And yeah. The one right here also has has it right there. Well, there you go. So, um, so like it, like a lot of people like don't really like that word because it's like a terror. It's like a label that has so much, you know, discrimination attached to it. But but you have like made it your own. You've like, you know, like what what you know why why what like schizophrenic? Who would want to be called a schizophrenic? Well, are we talking about like being called schizophrenic, like the per first person versus identity first, like that type of deal? Well, like the deal is that, you know, some people feel like, you know, I'm not schizophrenic. I'm someone who had like, you know, a spiritual experience oh, or, or, okay. or an alternate reality or like an extreme state, you know, all these different words. But but don't call me schizophrenic. I mean, if you don't want to be called schizophrenic, that's fine. If it's not affecting your life in a negative way, that's fine. But if your life is being affected in a negative way that you can't, you know, live your life positive in a, in, or, you know, productive in any way, then I would see, seek some help. Because people see that word schizophrenic, oh, it's the worst diagnosis. It's really not the worst diagnosis. There's people with depression, anxiety, that are more like, you know, antsy and struggle worse than me. And also, there's people with no diagnosis, which I would say are completely crazier than I am. So, like, I think being diagnosed with schizophrenia was the best thing that ever happened to me because then I could be treated for the correct illness. So it's really just a word. Who cares? It's not the suffering Olympics of, oh, this is worse, this is worse, this is worse. We're all on the same team here, you know? We're not fighting to be like, oh, I got it worse than you. No, you don't have it worse than me. You don't. You know, like, I spoke to this guy um, who also had, you know, the schizophrenia diagnosis. And he, he, he started to, like, I, I told him, like, about my experiences. And then he, he, he tried to one-up me that, like, like, he was crazier than me. You know, I'm the crazy yeah. master. So no. there's, there's some of that that happens in the community too. No, no, there, I don't think there's anyone crazier than anybody else with any certain mental <laughs> illness. Everything is on a spectrum. Like anything is on a spectrum, you know, here to here. It doesn't matter what it is. There's no mental illness that is worse than any other mental illness. You might have a spectrum that's worse, but that's whatever you are. And it's not the label that you're given makes you worse than anyone else. Is the mental illness spectrum like akin or similar to the LGBTQ plus spectrum? Who knows? The LGBTQ plus spectrum just keeps on changing. So I have no idea. Well, how do you feel like, how do you identify? I d this schizophrenic chilling person does whatever <laughs> I want. I don't really care about anybody else live myself. No, I, mean, I care I mean, about other people. I do care about other people, but I don't care what other people think of me. Like, I am just me, except for, for me. Do what I do. I don't care what you, like, say. Just, that's what I, that, that, I am me. I am me. I do my thing. That's it. Well, I mean, you've been in a relationship with a woman for many years, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. But, like, I'm not saying that defines me as, like, those little things don't define me as a person. I'm still me. Like all these diagnoses, I'm still, I'm still me. I'm not a walking, you know, you know, I'm not going to spread disease as I walk down the street. 
<laughs> you know, it's just about educating people. People just need to be educated on things. So what's like, the what best way? What's the well, best way to educate the public? You know, talking to them. I know I kind of just said I don't really educate people as I walk down the street, but I do have these these shirts that I do educate people as I walk down the street. But, you know, it's like, <clears throat> you, you just got to show people that mental illness is so common. It's everywhere. I guess if you're comparing it to LGBTQ, like, did you see Pride this weekend? It was a mob of people. But if it was like a, you know, mental health thing, it would have, not been that huge because I think less people are talk about their mental health than people talk about LGBTQ. I think that's more accepted right now than maybe mental health. I think mental health is growing, but still there's a huge stigma with mental health that people don't want to talk about because like in New York, one in five New Yorkers has a mental health issue, but nobody talks about it because of all this stigma. And I think that needs to change. And once that does change, then we will really see a difference. Maybe Mental Health Awareness Month will have a huge party like Pride did this weekend because it was off that the would chain. Be pretty, that would be pretty awesome. It was off the chain. Oh, you mean last Sunday? Oh, yeah. So you went? Yes. Uh, so, dude, like everybody went. It was insane. It was, there were so many people there. That's cool. Um, did you do a TED Talk? I did do a TED Talk. I did a TED Talk at uh, Janssen, um, Netherlands. Yes, I did. How long was it for? What do you mean? How long, long was there? the talk? The talk, they, you could only do 15 minutes. Okay, so you had to, so like, tell me about it. That's pretty exciting. Um, I arrived, I, I took a plane at night. I fell asleep the entire plane ride, pretty much. I get there. It's 4 a.m. my time. I meet up with Lucy. And they didn't have my room ready, and I fell asleep on the couch in the lobby. Hours later, I get woken up with, hello. <laughs> how are you? I go, oh, I'm good. And they're like, how can I help you? And I said, oh, my room's not ready. And she's like, let me help you. And she brought me to the front desk, got me to my room, and I just plopped on the bed because I was so just completely jet lagged. And then I heard later from Lucy, my, the host that was helping me, that she said, a guy at the bar noticed you and said you weren't moving. He thought something happened to you. I guess I just passed out so hard. But it was really, really fun because, like, all these different languages are being spoken. Like, there was, like, you know... And then I learned that, see, I thought I was going to the Netherlands, but then I also learned the Netherlands is known as Holland. And then people kept trying to explain to me that Holland and the Netherlands have a separation of a thing. And first Holland was this, and then the Netherlands is this, and this sound, and we're all Holland. And I'm like, what in the world? Because they have words, they were saying, it's not just one word. The word isn't just long, it's a combination of word. So it's like, Krombomsfeld means all these things, because I was staying on Krombomsfeld in Zandervoort. I don't know. And then I'm walking through the streets. I don't even, it was a complete culture shock of everybody just walking through the streets. Who knows? Who knows anything? I don't know where I was. Not, not even sure I left the same street. I kept going, walking backwards, forwards, walking backwards, forwards. And then I was trying to buy mugs. I don't know. And the guy kept yelling at me. I was buying mugs. And I'm just telling you all about the vacation that I had. Are there any I black getting, or brown I was getting yelled people? at trying to buy mugs. And then I ended up buying shot glasses for some reason. And that's my only purchase were these ridiculous shot glasses. Because I almost missed Can the I plane back. Something? Did you notice any black or brown people in the Netherlands? Notice what? Any black or brown BIPOC people? Tourists. Okay. Oh, but I did, I did meet a guy. I did meet a guy in the, in the local place. His, his name escapes me, but he was not a white dude. But that's all I know. I, I, Amir, Azur, Azriu, Ryu, Ryu, I forgot his name. But okay. he, I don't know, he, he, but honestly, um, the only black people I saw were Americans. Okay. Interesting. And tell us about the actual experience the actual of doing the, the, the talk. So the TED Talk, I yeah. was so nervous. I was so nervous. 
And I was like, I just had my pop-up booth there just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then the, like the guy that's going to introduce me is like, how do you want me to introduce you? I was like, say I'm the coolest person and I'm the best schizophrenic there ever was in New York City. And he gets him on stage. He's like, this is the greatest schizophrenic from New York City. And I'm like, did he really just call me a schizophrenic? But it's okay. He speaks three languages. That's fine. You know, if you speak three languages, you, know, you, can't, really, you can't crack on someone who speaks three languages. Whatever. It's going good. And then I get up there. I thought I was going to pee my pants, but I just went for it. I knew I, I memorized my entire speech. I thought, you know, and I just did it up. Did it up. Did it. And everyone said I did it really well. So I was very happy about it. Did that. you improvise at any point? Um, maybe, but I um, was so anxious I blacked out the whole thing. Oh, okay. So afterwards, what happened? You just collapsed? No, no, I didn't collapse. I just don't remember anything I really said up there. Uh, okay. But, but people so, told me they liked it. So when you reflect on it, what, are, what do you remember of like being in that moment? Of being in that moment was just kind of like, okay, I hope my jokes land. I hope my jokes land. And they didn't really land. <laughs> oh, it was not, it was, it was in the Netherlands. Because I have this one joke, I'm like, you know, when you're riding on the subway in New York, you, uh, you either whisper. If you don't whisper, you're either a tourist or you're just a schmuck. <laughs> like, that didn't land at all. Like they didn't know, they didn't, they didn't know. It, I mean, that was like, like, like it was a bit of a torturous experience. <laughs> well, I was trying, I was trying, well, I realized that people in the Netherlands are not going to get that joke. <laughs> they don't even know what schmuck means, right? Yeah, I don't think they know what schmuck means, so they were like, they didn't even get the joke at all. But there was another one, another TED Talk going on, but it was all in English, but then he plays a clip of how like he got some fame for something and it was all in Dutch. So I was like, I don't even know what this TED Talk is about. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Oh, man. Um, but then I was watching, they had the voice in Dutch on TV. And I was like, who are these people? Plus, this country is so tiny. How do they not know each other? But I'm telling you, they have the voice in Dutch. And then I was playing with Lucy. We played, we played some Uno, and then she was like, "Oh, teach her Uno." I go, "No, we have Uno in America. Come on." We don't have so Uno. Lucy is your girlfriend, right? No, Lucy is not my girlfriend. Lucy was the host I was staying with. Oh, okay. In Holland or the Netherlands or whatever you want to call it, in Zandervoort on Krombomsfeld. What's your girlfriend's name? Carrie. And um, did she come with you? No, she didn't. They wouldn't pay for her flight, and it was mad expensive. Jansen, the multi-billion dollar um, conglomerate, wouldn't pay a couple uh, thousand dollars for... Uh, <laughs> that sucks. Well, it is what it is. So, okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. You seem so excited. Right now? Yeah, you seem so excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like searching myself for a good question. Nothing's coming up. Nothing's coming up. Nothing's coming up. If you were me, what question would you ask you that you've never been asked? That I've never been asked? Um... Biggest mistake I made in business. I in business? Okay, let's hear it. Uh, go, signing a contract to pop up at the Long Island City Flea Market. <laughs> it's a terrible market. And the lady on the phone said, I'm a single mom. That's okay. how you know. That's how you know don't get involved. Um, so I think they closed that market, by the way. Long Island City. Okay, that's in Queens. Yeah. Um, I lost right. a lot of money that. That's when I didn't know oh, what I was doing. Okay, so the big mistake was you, you did it, but you lost a lot of money. Was it because it wasn't really crowded? It wasn't crowded. Nobody came. And I've learned at markets, like, you know, 
people don't like to spend 20 bucks on a shirt, but they'll go to the next booth and spend $30 on a piece of jewelry. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. Now I'm selling some jewelry. Michelle Hammer, are you happy? I'm happy. What makes Not all the time. I'm happy some of the time. You know, I try to be happy. What makes Michelle Hammer happy? Um, what makes me happy? When I make other people happy. When other people send me nice messages, you know? When, and like, when I hear, like, good things from other people that I've inspired them, I get messages a lot about inspiration that I inspire people. And I'm like, why don't I inspire people? And then I'm like, oh, that's so nice. You know, sp- take a compliment. Or when I get an order, I'm like, yay, I got an order. Somebody actually likes what I got. Yeah, that's so nice. You know, it's like these little things that just makes me happy. Or my wife makes me happy. My friends make me happy. My family makes me happy. Just... As long as everybody's in a good mood, I'm happy. You know when you're with a group of people and one person's just in a bad mood? That doesn't make me happy. That person can just go. Like, if you're mad, get out of here. So I use phone only. I have a poster also, in my living room that says, Welcome to no bad days. That's it. Welcome to no bad days. That in the living room. Nice. Mm-hmm. So you're also known as a mental health activist. And there were, like, rallies in Union Square Park, NYC, um, did you come up with the slogan, I'm mentally ill and I don't kill? I did. I did come up with that slogan. I did. It's a very good slogan. Yes. Um, and this, a lot of the, the discrimination we face is because the pu- general public views people with mental illness as violent crazies, right? Yes, absolutely. Unless they're brown people, then it's domestic terrorism. Oh. You ever get that? When it's a white person, they're mentally ill. If it's a brown person, it's terrorism. You ever notice? Um, wow, you, can, you, can you tell us more about that? I'm just saying, that's what it is. That's what it is. And for some reason, they think hate, hate is not a mental illness. Racism is not a mental illness, you know? Do you, I mean, how do you feel about it? Do you feel racism and hate, hatred are mental illnesses? No, ra- racism is not a mental illness and hate is not a mental illness. So, like, stop blaming these people with these mass shootings with these guns on saying that they're mentally ill. They're not mentally ill. They're, they're having access to guns they don't need to have. Right, right. And... That's the problem, is, is allowing people to have guns. It's too many guns. Let's take away, I mean, I'm not saying, like, it's going to be a big thing, get rid of all guns, whatever, fine. You know, I'm the big debate. I'm not having a big debate. Whatever, fine. It's just like, you shouldn't be allowed to go, that kind of a thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But then anytime anyone who's like, you know, any kind of brown skin, there's like, oh, domestic terrorism. They're a domestic terrorist. They're a domestic terrorist. But white people are, are always mentally ill, and that's what it always is. And that's what I'm just trying to say. Not just about white people, but also everybody. It's just a whole thing. Stop blaming mentally ill people on, on all the shootings. It's not mental illness is the, not the issue. The hate is not a, a mental illness. Racism is not a mental illness. I'm okay. mentally ill. Mentally so if Ill. crazy people aren't dangerous, what are they? But the thing is, you're more likely to be a victim of mental illness, of, of, of hate or violence than to be the perpetrator of hate if you have mental illness. So to blame people with mental illness doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. You're just a person. What are you? You're a person. Mm-hmm. And you're a scapegoat, apparently. People just like to send in scapegoats. Like, oh, this is the reason they did that. Oh, this is the reason. Oh, this is the reason. You don't know the reason. You're making up a reason. Is it true that anyone in the, anyone can become mentally ill at any point in their lives? I, I probably, I don't, you know, sometimes trauma happens. Sometimes, you know, things get brought up. Who knows what's going on? You may go through a really bad experience, anything. Maybe it's genetic, maybe it's not. You know, I'm not an expert, but I think it could. 
Could a really bad breakup result in mental illness? I think it, you might get really, really depressed about it. Maybe you need to talk to somebody about it. Um, I wouldn't know if that could give you a full blown mental illness, but I think there is like, you know, heartbreak related depression. What about heartbreak related psychosis? I don't know. It's a good question. I'm not sure because I've never had heartbreak related psychosis, so I'm not exactly sure about that. It's a good question for a doctor. Or we could always ask the best person, which is Google. <laughs> Google knows everything. Right, right, right. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google that. Heartbreak yeah. re heartbreak related psychosis. <clears throat> You'll you might find a blog by some schmuck about that. Mm hmm. Hmm. Are you Jewish? I sure am. Was that a part of your upbringing, a Jewish upbringing? Um, just reform. Reform upbringing, not really religious at all. Doing like the basic holiday stuff. Bat mitzvah, but I, I didn't like Hebrew school, but my mom told me if you want to bar bat mitzvah, it's kind of required that you go. You don't have to, but if you want one, you have to go. And that was like the thing that all the girls were doing. So I just went. And for some reason, I could still read Hebrew, even though I don't know what it says. <laughs> oh, so okay. Yeah. What about like, like Madonna was into the Kabbalah? Did you explore well, the, any of that? The thing about Kabbalah is Kabbalah is really for Hasidic Jews. And Kabbalah is really supposed to only be practiced by Hasidic Jews. So it's funny to me that these other people are studying Kabbalah when it's really just supposed to be a very religious, religious, religious thing. But it's just a little strange. I mean, isn't this- What I've learned about Kabbalah is that you're, you're not supposed to study Kabbalah unless you're like ultra Orthodox. Oh, that's interesting. That's what I've learned. That's what I've heard about it. Like, so like, like Madonna studying it. It's like, who, you're not ultra orthodox. What are you doing? Right. But you know what? Though bringing Jewish, well, you know, um, just into the like, you know, culture and making it popular, always a good thing. Because, you know, we have, Jews have such bad, um, you know, anti-Semitism problems always. So if you're going to make it popular, go for it, I guess, you know. What do you think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Oh, let's get into it. You want to get into that? That's a touchy one. Listen, so all I have to say is that if you don't agree with Israel, that is cool. But if you support Hamas, you are a fool. Boom. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess we can move on from that. Move on. We don't need to get in because I, I could pop off for 40 minutes. Do, <laughs> do you have relatives in Israel? I had a cousin living in Spot. He got cancer and decided to pray the cancer away. He is now deceased. Um, sorry. It's okay. I'm just saying. That's what happens when you believe that the power of prayer is more efficient than medical help. Do you have a spiritual life, Michelle Hammer? Well, I like to think that I'm not alone in the world, that, that maybe something has happened. You know, I've been in like bad situations where I thought I could never get out, but then sometimes I've made it through. I do have this story of going to the Western Wall and everyone thinks I'm absolutely insane when I tell them this story, but I go to that wall. Have you ever been there? Uh, no. No, well, the thing is, you know, there's the wall. The men get this much, the women get this much. So ever all the women are waiting and waiting and waiting and I finally get my note and I touch the wall and I'm trying to pray and I'm praying I'm like, okay, what else can I pray about? And all of a sudden, I feel a huge force going through the top of my head, through my arms and into the wall and, it's, and I'm being told, you know, what's the most important things I need to know in my life, what I should do, like what, what's most important in my life. And then when I opened my eyes and took my hands off the wall, it was gone. 
So I believe I had a very spiritual experience at the Western Wall. And everyone I tell that to is like, yeah, did you take your meds that day? Well, what, what was the message you got from the... Yeah, um, the message was yeah. never hurt yourself ever again. The most important thing in your life is to never hurt yourself ever again. And that, it, that I have listened to that for the re for since then. But I'm telling you, I felt a crazy force go through my head, through my shoulders, and into my hands touching the wall. It, it was just like this moment of clarity because I'm sitting there. What can I pray for? What can I pray for? What's the, what should I say? I'm here. It's the holiest place in the, in, that it, in the Jewish world. What do I need to know? And it, it was, it was, whoa. Was it and ecstasy? I, I, everyone can say that it was my schizophrenia. Fine. I will never, ever say that that didn't happen. Was it a feeling like of ecstasy? Not of ecstasy, a moment of complete clarity. Was it peaceful? Peaceful, clarity, learning, like nothing else I've ever experienced in my life. That's pretty beautiful. Yeah. That's pretty nice. Did it mean not hurt yourself physically or mentally or both? I think uh, physically. Oh, okay. So it's okay to hurt yourself mentally? Well, I, I, don't, I don't, I mean. You know, like by. I didn't go into detail. I wasn't given the details. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Let go a little too early. But I don't know, mentally, I mean, you got to fight. You got to fight the demons in the head to make sure you don't hurt yourself mentally, physically. Do you still hear voices? Um, on occasion, but um, it's New York City, so people just yell all the time, so I don't really know if it's my voice or if it's somebody yelling my name or if people have my name, I don't really know. A thing that I do is I constantly think I see people that I know and then it's not them. Um, and the thing is, I, get, I go more delusional, like I'll just be sitting here going, or I'll be sitting to go, and I'll burst into laughter. Like people sometimes, I have to wear sunglasses on the subway because I'll just stare at one point and then I'll just burst into laughter at something and people are like, you laugh at like, who are you talking to? You know, like, you, you uh, crack yourself up. I do. I crack myself up because of things in my head. But the thing is, if I, like so many people think, or I give weird looks because I'm not, it like, I'm not really looking at you. I'm looking at something else. Like people are like, oh, what, what do you want me to look for? I'm like, oh, not you, not you, not you. Like, you know. <laughs> so if it's not them, then it's just something that's going on inside. Right, 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 right. And yeah, that's hard for people to understand. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah it's hard. It's, it's, yeah, my friend once said like, oh, you know, she just has that stare that she does sometimes. You just got to ignore it. Although, you know, if you, I observe people just walking down the block in my neighborhood and some of the, and when they're walking by themselves, sometimes they have like a scrunchy face, like, like, oh, like what's going on in their heads right now? Some people walk down with a smile, you know, the happy walking down and good, happy thoughts. Some people are like fucking scared. Their eyes are popping out of their head. They're, they're rushing. So, you know, people have internal experiences all the time. Um, but I guess when you're in a train, it's like an enclosed space and it's more noticeable. Yeah, you know, what's handy is headphones because, you know, everyone's got, like, headphones in. So they're always on the phone or something or listening to music. So if I have headphones in and I'm talking, oh, I'm on the phone. Or when we had the, the mask mandate, that is so handy. Oh, yeah, I like it, too. That is the handiest thing because you can't see me, my lips moving. Yeah. That, that's a good one. On the train, that is a really good one. Yeah. Sunglasses, headphones, mask, <laughs> boom. Yeah, and you could probably wear the mask for the years yet to come. I, dude, I why mean, not? Asian women on Canal Street were wearing masks way before COVID. Yo, they knew. They knew. <laughs> yeah, they knew. They knew. And everyone, everyone you hear now, they're like, I haven't been sick in so long. Oh, because we've been wearing these masks. <laughs> I don't know what we used to look at, look at people like that on the sofa, like, oh my God, I can't believe they're wearing masks. They're so ridiculous. Now we're like, why did we never wear masks? The subway is disgusting. Somebody told me recently that the subway has TV. Like, the subway has TV. 
Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's yeah. great. That, that's nice to know. Yeah, tuberculosis, right? Yeah, that's nice. Is that a oh, well. is that a really horrible disease? I do, I, do, I I don't I. It used, I don't to know. Kill people. it used to kill people. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm not. I try to be. I got I got an MD from Google University. You know, just Google. You know, Google tells you everything. So you talked about having this intense spiritual experience at the Wailing Wall. What about what about what about like when you actually were experiencing psychosis? Was there anything spiritual about that? No, dude, no, yo, I saw a spider, no, turn into a tiger, walking towards me, no, nothing spiritual, I saw squirrels running around my bedroom, no, nothing spiritual about that, no, no, I mean, I was, a, I had a pop-up shop when I was talking to some girl, and she goes, what about the good things about schizophrenia, and I was like, I don't know anything that's good about it, she goes, well, the, tr the people that think it's like a gift, I go, well, it's definitely not a gift, and she goes, but you know, the, the, the um, you know, those like, uh, you know, Native American tribes or those tribes that do the thing and they think it's like, I'm like, no, it's not a gift. And she walked away. I was like, I don't need that in my life. Oh. There's no gift. There's just no, I don't see a gift at all. And I say people think they're psychic when they're, they have schizophrenia and they're psychic. Whenever I think I'm psychic, I know I'm having an episode. I'm not psychic. Have you heard of the Icarus Project? It's familiar. They call, well, it used to be run by Sasha de Brule, and mm -hmm. they, they call mental illnesses dangerous gifts. Dangerous okay. gifts. Dangerous gifts. Is that the voice hearers? Uh, no, that's something different. Oh, okay. The, the Icarus Project is like, it was originally focused on people with bipolar diagnosis and, and creative outlets like art and... And, mu and music and stuff like that. So you never heard of it. That's interesting. I, I have heard of the Icarus Project, uh -oh. but I don't really know what it was about. Okay. Really, but but whatever. But I'm just well, saying. What do you think about the concept of like a dangerous, a mental illness being a dangerous gift? Why is it a gift at all? Okay, well... Some people have voices that are very um, comforting and, and wise and give them like good uh, advice, believe it or not. Um, so for, some, for a person like that, it could be a gift. Um, so, and some I, people- I mean, I know people that do have positive, like nice voices and do help them a lot. I know people like that. And also, for some people, when they experience the manic highs of like an emotional it, uh, whatever, um, they, they're mad creative and they, they create extraordinary works of art. That's a gift. Well, I create extraordinary works of art too, but I do that when I'm feeling anxious. Not when I'm manic. When I'm manic, I don't want to do any art because I don't want to sit still. But I'm manic, I want to run around all over the place. I would never want to make art when I'm manic. Okay, but do you think it's possible someone might? Well, of course. I've heard of this like a bazillion times where people do, they do drugs and then they, then they make some art. Or they did oh. this and then they made art. They did this and then made art. Right. And they did this and they made art. Right, they but this. it's a gift made. because you don't need drugs. It's like innate. It's like part of your, your biology. You know, that's why th these are some reasons like people Salvador call Like Salvador Dali, like Salvador Dali being, or no, Van Gogh. Van Gogh cutting off his ear and making great art. Yeah, making yeah. Like, like Van Gogh. Gogh. I mean, like so, like Pollock, like so many. Like Pollock, Bacow, is Pollock Bacow. Bacow. art to you? Do you find Pollock to be artistic? Do I find, I, I like his art, yeah. I can do uh, that stuff too. I can pour some paint. <laughs> I can I can make artwork just like Pollock. Okay. And I'll tell you, I made it during a manic episode. What do you think of like calling people with mental illness who are artists outsider artists? Or That's like this? Stupid. 
That's okay. so dumb. That out, an artist is an artist. How are you an outsider artist? And how what about, how do you, they know that they're already a mentally ill artist? Like how many artists are mental illness, but they don't label themselves as a mentally ill artist? Why do you have to be labeled a mentally ill artist? But isn't that how, isn't that like part of uh, Fountain House's marketing that these are mentally ill artists? Well, that's the gallery is that the members of Fountain House submit to the gallery. That's just how it is. They're mentally ill artists, but I'm just saying you can go into very many art shows and the artists are mentally ill. You just don't know that. I mean, picture like a bourgeois person who bought a, a nice piece of art from Fountain House and they're entertaining their guests and one of the guests says, oh, what's that on the wall? Oh, that was done by a mentally ill person from Fountain House. And then people are like, wow, oh, mental illness. I, I thought they were just violent crazies. No, I bet you they'd be like, oh, yes, I think most artists are mentally ill. Oh, do you remember Vincent van Gogh? Yes, he chopped off his ear. Yes, he is mentally ill. So many artists are mentally ill. It's just, oh, the artists, the best artists are all mentally ill. It was sort of stupid, stupid conversation. <laughs> um, Does this look like mentally ill art to you? Or does it look like this, like mentally ill art? Or does it look like art? It just looks like art. Yeah, it doesn't look like mentally ill it art. Looks it like really looks like really cool, art. like cosmic because art. Does, is there a difference in, if you're looking at two pieces of artwork and one was known to be made, okay, one was made by a person with mental illness, one was made by an artist that does not say they are mentally ill, could you tell the difference? No, not, well, you know, there, there was, I did know uh, uh, someone with schizophrenia who was an artist back in like, oh, back in like 2000. And, and his art involved not just imagery, but also a lot of tiny little writing, like all over, like his little messages all over. And if you read those messages, you'd be like, oh, may, you know, maybe he's, um, maybe the, he's in a different state of mind. Was, does this look like an art? Did a mentally ill person make this? Or is well, it just you know, but I, you know, I know tons of mentally ill people, so who are mad creative. So I would say it's possible. But it's just art. Yeah, I know. I, I if I. <laughs> it's art. I know. It's but just art. Okay, let's put it like this: some art is more mentally ill than others, because, okay. like, just like. My, I'm just, I described my, this guy I knew and his little messages in his art, uh, writ, like words all over the art. Um, and if you read them, you'd be like, okay, this guy thinks really differently. Maybe there's, some, maybe, maybe there's something going on. Maybe. But, and he told me he loves to create his art when he's psychotic. Whatever works, dude, whatever works. And that, that's an example yeah, of a, gets that's, going. And that's a dangerous gift, you know? He's using his gift of psychosis, which is dangerous because it well, could be... And, you know. Well, at least when he says psychosis, he's creating art and not um, being one of those dangerous mentally ill people. Yes, yeah. Yeah, those, dan those dangerous, dangerous people, you see. Yeah. Danger. Danger! Danger! Let's see if I have that for me. I don't know what it is. So we were talking about like when you went to the Netherlands and I asked you if there are any BIPOC people. Mm -hmm. Are there BIPOC people who are a regular part of your life? Um, yeah. I was just grabbing was. This is how my art starts off. Oh, okay. Let's yes. I saw in one of your videos how you would use this sketchbook and just use some magic marker and create these things and then ultimately transfer them to digital media, right? Right. So this is just what I do. That's pretty I cool. cool. I know. Well, I mean, you identify as someone as you identify as schizophrenic NYC. That's your mm -hmm. business. That's your calling card. And at the same time, you're like, hey, man, don't judge my art as mentally ill. I'm not saying my art is men no, no. I'm not saying don't judge my art as mentally ill. I'm just saying like, like, I'm saying that 
there are other artists that just don't disclose that they're mentally ill. Okay. Like if I went to just an art show and just brought my artwork, I would just bring my, I, would, I don't know if I would say, you know, the whole story, like everything, or I don't know. I'm just saying, like, there's a lot of artists with mental illness that don't go by a mentally ill artist. They don't say, cause themselves to be mentally ill artists, whatever. But that, the whole thing is just, like, I don't do, it's just, I just came, I was just, it just comes from more anxiety-driven things, you know? More just anxiety stuff. Anxiety. So this is a way to calm the anxiety. Right. And now I'm just saying nonsense. Like, like, I don't go psychotic and psychosis and just make a million different things. I just draw little things. And then I have fun. It's fun. I just think art is fun and it's cool and I like doing it and other people like it and it's fun. I'm not trying to say I don't label myself as schizophrenic NYC mental. I mean, dude. I don't know. Are we in a fight? So, you okay. What is the question? Oh, yeah. Um, so you have BIPOC friends, right? Of course. Okay, that's good. Um, I mean, I could edit out these pregnant pauses, but I kind of like them. Well, if you want to find me in my pop-up shop, I try to go every weekend to 48th and 9th in front of the Townhouse Gallery where I pop up. But it's been a heat wave. Right. So I haven't been going. Plus, I have things to do on the weekend sometimes. But I try to be there if anyone wants to find me. Last time I had to leave early because I was dying of the heat. But it's fun. I pop up there. I meet amazing people. Whenever I tell people that I have schizophrenia, they either tell me they have a mental illness, a friend has a mental illness, or a family member does, which only proves my point that if it's so common, why is there so much stigma? Does that make any sense? So is this this is your life is your life's work to destigmatize mental illness is that your mission is that what gives meaning to your life It does I just want to get people talking about mental illness 5 years ago it was not nearly spoken about as much as it's spoken about now Let's talk about it especially things like psychosis and schizophrenia cuz people have a really bad like like think what they think about those two things. They think danger, 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 danger. No. Change the narrative. Let people understand what is real, what is not real. So what do you want to do with the years that are left to you? Live? I don't know. How many years are left to me? Um, I don't know how old you are. But I, I think people start to get, like, sick and decrepit at, like, 65, 70. I don't know what I want to do. I want to just be happy, live life. Very good. Are you doing, and you're doing that? Trying my best. All right, all right. Any parting final words? Uh, go to schizophrenic.nyc if you want to purchase anything. I mean, on Instagram, schizophrenic.nyc. And uh, don't be paranoid, you look great. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle Hammer. Thank you.